Constitutional Enforcement Pre-Study Materials, Part 2. In Part 1 we reviewed the overall current status of our situation, which includes the fact that millions of Americans have been deliberately misidentified as different kinds of U.S. citizens and disenfranchised as electors in their own country. It also includes the, to some people, startling news that adult Americans who operate in their correct political status are by definition members of the militia. We not only have a right to enforce the Constitution and the public law, we have the duty to do so. So as members of our national, meaning state militias, we are all peacekeeping officials and have the ability to make citizens arrests, at gunpoint, if necessary. We also have the right and responsibility to intervene in the presence of any clearly unlawful activity. Years ago, my husband was at a bank in California when two would-be bank robbers walked in and began the drill, intimidating the tellers, waving guns, hurting everyone into a corner, etc. There were two women in the group, one young lady who was about eight months pregnant and her grandmother, a small, well-dressed woman in her early 80s. One of the bank robbers shoved the younger pregnant woman violently onto the floor. And Grandma took the .38 out of her patent leather purse and blew him away. Then she dispatched the other bank robber. And, as she holstered her gun, she commented grimly, that will be enough of that. That's an example of citizen justice in action, not vigilante action. It never hit the newspapers. And she was never charged. Why? Because she knew her rights and her responsibilities. It was up to her to enforce the public law, because there was nobody else there to do it. Armed bank robbery and reckless endangerment of life are clearly against the public law of this country. The bank robbers paid the price. And my point to you, is that they should have. My further point to you, is that that young woman was owed protection under the public law. The actual American public law, that is, the civilian common law, is very simple and very draconian and based on the Ten Commandments. You rustle somebody's cattle, you hang. You get blind drunk and drive and kill someone, it's murder one, not vehicular homicide, not manslaughter. You rob a bank, you rape, you murder, boom. No questions asked. So far as the soil jurisdiction of this country goes, that is the way it has always been and the way it still is. Anyone who doesn't know that, needs to be told. Our public law has been derided by police unions and others as Wild West justice and vigilantism, but it's not. It's us, honoring our duty to keep the peace and preserve justice in this country. Some years ago, a local pastor was closing up the church one afternoon when two robbers entered. He shot both of them, dead. There was a trial, but only to determine probable cause and whether or not the robbers were armed. The military justice system in charge of overseeing territorial citizens and the municipal civil courts in charge of municipal citizens don't like it when we enforce the actual public law, but the truth and the fact is that state citizens of the United States have both the right and the duty of enforcement. The police unions and academies are self-interested entities, they resent what they consider to be competition for their jobs, but the additional plain fact of the matter is that peacekeeping officers are seldom sitting next to you and on duty when some criminal or nutcase opens fire, and law enforcement officers private leos don't have an obligation to come to your assistance, even though you are paying their payrolls. The average response time between when a homeowner calls for help and when police arrive is half an hour. In half an hour, an efficient criminal has killed the homeowner, raped and bound his daughter, and stolen everything of value in the house. Now, I don't like putting that in the face of Leos who are putting in a good faith effort, but that's the facts, ma'am. And it's not a problem that can be fixed simply by hiring more police. It's a problem of time and space. Our forefathers fully empowered and armed our populace for many reasons, not the least of which is to assist conventional police forces and bulwark peacekeeping functions. A properly trained, armed, and organized, or as the founders put it, well-regulated militia, a word which refers to the adult general populace of each state, is a profound blessing to the cause of law enforcement and actual justice. As you saw in part 1, our foreign federal subcontractors have led us a merry dance and been up to criminal tricks on our shores. To hide their dirty work, they have deliberately dumbed down our population by giving our children half an education. That applies to what has gone on in our law schools and our police academies as well. 
A deliberate program of disinformation and omission of, as my hero, Bert Gummer, put it, critical need to know information, has gone on in this country and around the world, wherever the incorporated and privatized government service providers have proliferated. The goal of all these privatized government corporations is to collect more oppressive power, more money, more jobs, and more union control so that they make more profit. For the rest of us, the goal is simple justice. If you are a new graduate of one of their trooper academies you have studied some odd subjects, like, how to lie, and, subversive mentalities. You've also been grossly misled and taught to blindly accept the use of, and belief in, oxymoron descriptions like, sovereign citizen, attorney general, and, secular church. One cannot be a, sovereign, and a, citizen, at the same time. The terms are mutually exclusive. So every time you use such a misnomer you identify yourself as a rube, another dumb cluck who swallowed the government for hire, cool aid. Attorney General translates to shipping clerk general and what they are shipping out of this country shouldn't be shipped. They are engaged in racketeering and asset stripping. And if anyone needs an explanation why secular church is an oxymoron, let me know. How many of you have heard the phrase rule of law usually repeated like some kind of mantra? The rule of law this and the rule of law that? How many have gathered the impression that maintaining the rule of law is your ultimate duty? The rule of law means the policies and procedures of the courts, that is, the court rules. What they are so anxious to preserve is their own procedural matrix, which is private, arbitrary, designed to defraud people, and has nothing to do with any actual public law, or even statutory law, at all. It should come as no surprise to you that what is taught in our law schools isn't law of the sort we assume, either. What has been taught in American law schools for the better part of a century is corporate policy and procedure, the rule of law, not the actual law, supplemented with state of state statutes, federal code, administrative code, and regulations. None of these things are public law and none of them were ever meant to be applied to Joe Average American. They've been misapplied deliberately to Joe American, who has been shanghaied, kidnapped, unlawfully converted, used in this case in the sense of religious conversion, for the express purpose of subjecting Joe American to these foreign corporate forms of law, that is, laws meant to apply only to corporations and corporation officials and employees, and thus, depriving him of the public law he is owed. Most bar attorneys aren't familiar with actual public law, because that's not their job and not their jurisdiction. They will stare at you like deer in the headlights if you say a word about the Constitution, or try to poo-poo the law of the land, because they are operating improperly for the most part, under the international law of the sea or global law of the air. Remember what I told you about the cold mercenary war that the territorial and municipal government corporations have been playing out on our shores for a century and a half? How they have deliberately misidentified Americans as combatants in this phony war, so they could conscript us and confiscate our property assets without paying us. In order to do that, they had to corrupt the courts and convert all the lawyers. They did this using the court rules. It's their private court rules that mandate membership in the bar associations, and which then creates a closed union shop environment in violation of Taft-Hartley and the Smith Act, and the operation of this coercive illegal union power is then used to force lawyers into criminal obedience and participation in fraud and racketeering. Because of the court rules, that is, the rule of law instead of the law, if you are a lawyer and you don't go along with their corruption, you can't eat. You can't practice your profession. They also set up the Chris Kickback System, Court Registry Investment System, by which all the judges get a kickback to their pension and pension investment programs for every conviction they make and a percentage of the take for every penalty and fee and home foreclosure sale. Can you say the words, stink, stank, stunk? Need any further explanation of why there is a 96-98% to 98 conviction rate in these courts? Most of the law enforcement professionals and peacekeeping officers I have ever known, including my own cousin, Doug Kruger, who was police commissioner in Rochester, Minnesota, for many years, are good men. Family men. Men who just want their communities and their country to be safe from criminals. By far the majority of our police and peacekeeping officials have assumed and trusted that the courts are honest and that the judges and attorneys are honest, too. 
they have looked up to the members of the bar and respected the judges, and all the while, these foreign court organizations have been involved in the greatest identity theft, the biggest credit, probate, and embezzlement fraud, in world history. Right under all our noses. That's part two. Let the shock wear off. Read it again. Let the shock wear off, and read it again.